morning, everyone. My name is Jason Elstrup, and I'm the president of Downtown Madison, Inc. Welcome to another virtual What's Up Downtown Breakfast. We are so excited this morning to have U.S. Senator Tammy Baldwin joining us to take talk about uh, COVID-19, infrastructure, downtowns, and more. Thank you all for being here this morning. We hope you're all doing well. Before we hear from the senator, though, we'd like to first recognize a few new members to DMI. Uh, great news, things are, are headed back in the right direction, we hope. Uh, we can see some light at the end of the tunnel. We've got some great new members coming in this month, including ARC Studio 3 DLLC, Essential Remediation, Gooseberry on the Square, the Hilton Garden in Madison downtown, right on Regent Street, IMEG, Lions Realty and Investment. Welcome back, uh, Martin Lackey. It's, it's good to have you back in the group. And our friend Jeff Burkhart with Literacy Network of Dane County, Jonathan and uh, Gretchen and the team at the Madison Ballet, and last but not least, Sarah and the team at the Rainbow Project. Thanks to all these new members. Thank you all for being here. We look forward to seeing you at events coming up soon. Um, next, we'd like to thank our sponsors for the event today. We honestly would not be here without you guys. Thank you to our major series sponsors, Whipfully LLP, our supporting series sponsors, Ho-Chunk Gaming, Madison, Michael Best, and Friedrich, the State Bank of Cross Plains, and our special contributors, the beautiful Edgewater Hotel and UW Health, Unity Point Health Mariner, and Courts for all of your assistance today. We'd also like to thank our good friends at Carlson, Black, O'Callaghan, and Battenberg for participating today as our monthly sponsor for today's event. We greatly appreciate all that, that Matt and, and Angie and Dan do for Downtown Madison, for DMI, longtime board members. And we are excited to welcome my former neighbor just a few blocks away, Dan O'Callaghan, who is a partner with Carlson Black and to say a few brief words, followed by Dan, Anita Mohammed, a partner with Whitley LLC and treasurer of DMI will be here today. Welcome, Dan, how are you this morning? Dan, we got you muted. That's the, the, the theme of 2020. That's the trick of it, isn't it? Muted. <laughs> Sorry, morning, everybody. Dan. Good morning, Jason. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, so it's my privilege to say a few words to welcome all of you this morning. Uh, Carlson Black is a proud sponsor of uh, this morning's event, and we're proud to partner with DMI. Uh, we're especially pleased to be here this morning to help welcome Senator Tammy Baldwin. Uh, so on behalf of my partners and colleagues at Carlson Black, uh, I want to thank Jason and everyone at DMI for bringing us these programs every month um, and finding ways to keep us connected to one another. Um, so we've got this incredible opportunity uh, this morning to spend the next hour with uh, our Senator, uh, Tammy Baldwin. Uh, we're so fortunate to be able to call her our Senator. She's done and continues to do so many great uh, things to advocate uh, for issues that are important to downtown Madison, um, including her recent call to fully fund the Community Development Block Grant Program. That's an issue that's near and dear to my heart as the former chair of the City of Madison's Block Grant Committee. Um, it's all about uh, community development, jobs, affordable housing, um, those are issues that are important to, um, to me, to my colleagues, to the clients that we work with on a daily basis, um, and really to all of us that care about the health and well-being of cities. So thank you, Senator Baldwin, for continuing to be a champion for strong and healthy communities. And again, on behalf of all of us at Carlson Black, uh, thank you to DMI for hosting this event, and thank you for allowing us the opportunity to welcome you this morning. Good morning. My name is Anita Mohammed, and I'm a partner with Whipley LLP and member of the DMI Board of Directors. Whipley is pleased to participate as the major sponsor of the DMI What's Up Downtown Breakfast Series. Thank you for joining us this morning. As a multidiscipline professional services firm, Whipley delivers effective, personalized services to help companies and organizations like yours through these trying times to help create lasting, positive impact. We're here to help leaders like you navigate the ever-changing economic environment, and we invite you to visit whipley.com for industry-specific insights for financial institutions, construction and real estate, nonprofits, and more. Thank you for joining today's program, and I hope you're all safe and well. Thank you so much, Dan and Anita. We, uh, as always, thank you for your continued sponsorship of 
not only DMI, but downtown Madison. Anita and Dan are two great stewards and community leaders in our city. And Dan had to work with my wife on the CDBG committee here in the city of Madison. So thank you for all your service to the city. Your terms on the Urban League Board, you know, do so much, both Anita and Dan, for our community. Now, it is my honor and privilege to welcome and introduce our distinguished speaker this morning, U.S. Senator Tammy Baldwin, who calls Madison her home. Senator Baldwin was born and raised in Madison by her grandparents, and right here in the Badger State. Her grandfather was an assistant, or excuse me, a scientist at the University of Wisconsin, and her grandmother was a seamstress at the university's theater company. Tammy graduated from Madison West High School, go Regents, my wife is proud, and went on to double major in political science and mathematics at Smith College. In 1989, she received her law degree from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. She served on the Madison Common Council and was elected to four terms on the Dane County Board of Supervisors, and in 1992 was elected to the Wisconsin State Assembly, serving three terms. In 1998, Wisconsin's second con congressional district elected Tammy to Congress. And after 14 years in the House of Representatives, Tammy was elected to the Senate in 2012 and was reelected in 2018. Senator Baldwin serves on the Senate Appropriations Committee uh, and, a, and a, a new um, lead chair position in one of the subcommittees. Congratulations in agriculture. Uh, the Senate Committee on Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions, and the Senate Committee on Commerce, Science, and Transportation. In response to the public health uh, and economic crisis we face, Senator Baldwin is currently focused on working past legislation in the Senate that provides more support to Wisconsin businesses, workers, families, and local governments throughout Wisconsin. Thank you. Welcome, Senator Baldwin. We're so glad to have you here this morning. How is everything in DC? Okay. We got you. We hear you perfect. Oh, Good morning, you. Senator. How are you? How's everything in Washington? Um, well, it, it's going, uh, it, it's tremendous right now. Uh, so, uh, in, in, you know, with the impeachment trial behind us now, we are working very uh, assiduously on confirming uh, Joe Biden's nominee, nominees uh, to be uh, cabinet in cabinet positions and sub cabinet positions. We are um, working on what is called the American Rescue Package or plan, uh, which is uh, a very robust uh, uh, rescue uh, COVID relief uh, plan. Um, the House is working it up this week, and the Senate will take it up uh, the following week, next week. And uh, it is feeling very productive right now. So that's very exciting. Uh, and um, I wanted to start with, uh, first of all, just a thank you for having me. Um, if I were home, I would be in downtown Madison. I call downtown Madison my, my home. And, um, I, and I wanted to just start first with, uh, pandemic related issues and then kind of move into the things that I see um, on the horizon, not too distantly, uh, that, that uh, are beyond the pandemic. But uh, first, a, a little bit of a, a report on uh, vaccination. I mean, that's been such uh, now more than a glimmer of hope. Uh, it's something that uh, we know will help us put the pandemic in the rearview mirror uh, over a matter of time. And I can report that Wisconsin is doing very well with regard to vaccine uh, administration, um, both with regard to the number of people who've gotten the first shot of either the Moderna or Pfizer vaccine. Um, uh, many uh, obviously have gotten both shots um, we're seeing our case numbers go down, cross our fingers. Um, and we've also been rated very highly compared to other states in terms of administration of the um, number of vaccines that we've been allocated in the state. So um, that is heartening. But I just want to stress to all the leaders on this uh, Zoom uh, breakfast meeting, what's up downtown, um, it, uh, that as leaders, you play a really significant role uh, of influence and messaging with regard to the need to remain vigilant. 
so many people, uh, we're all exhausted from this pandemic. We're all battered by this pandemic. But the um, but until we're at herd immunity, until we've gotten all the uh, vaccines uh, allocated and in people's arms, it is still so important that you all uh, talk about the importance of social distancing, of masking, of uh, doing uh, what we need to do to keep one another safe and to have a healthy uh, community. And I know that uh, many of you have collaborated with the Stop COVID Spread Coalition. Um, I thank you for that leadership. And I would suggest that as we prepare for the months ahead, um, that we work to ensure that the messing, messaging effort evolves to address the importance of this continued vigilance, as well as um, promoting uh, getting vaccinated as soon as you're eligible and when you can, um, and combating particularly the COVID myths that are out there. Um, I think that's gonna be really key to all of us being on the same message. Um, now, I, I wanted to move on to um, the most recently passed COVID relief package at the end of last year and the PPP program, which I know many are aware of and have participated in, um, to make the point that uh, your feedback over the past year had, has really led to help us strengthen the PPP program and resolve some of the uncertainty around it that accompanied the initial rollout. You know, so it was rolled out uh, in the spring of last year, almost a year ago. And it was a completely new program. Uh, as a completely new uh, pandemic response program, it had its hiccups and uh, uh, flaws as it was first rolled out. But your feedback and those of other, um, you know, business leaders across the state really informed our ability to be able to make significant improvements um, as we've renewed the program and re-upped the program. Um, I, I heard uh, from so many of you about uh, what we needed to do. Number one, uh, or perhaps what I heard the most about was simplifying the forgiveness process. Um, at first, uh, uh, it, it was um, so cumbersome that some were uh, returning the loans, frankly, and that is not the desired outcome. I think additionally, I heard a lot about um, uh, making it clear that uh, the PPP and EIDL um, expenses were tax deductible. And I'm pleased to report that we were able to address both of these issues in the bill that passed late last year. Um, the PPP has a, a second draw program, which is available for smaller companies that have seen a 25% revenue loss, and more organizations and nonprofits are eligible in this round than were in the initial round. Restaurants, bars, hotels, and other hospitality establishments are able to now get higher maximum uh, PPP loans. Um, I also wanted to take a, a quick moment to talk about live event venues. Um, as, as everyone knows, the live event venues were the first to close and arguably will be among the last to uh, fully reopen. Um, and I, I worked with colleagues uh, across the aisle uh, to push for funding specifically for live venues. And I'm glad that it was included in relief legislation. Um, it authorized 15 billion for grants to independent entertainment venues and the related businesses that rely on those live venues uh, uh, to make, uh, make ends meet. Um, it's really, because this is a new aspect, it's really critically important that the Small Business Administration, the SBA, uh, gets the implementation of this right. And so uh, again, I want to say that I wanna hear from you if you are experiencing any problems, we want to be able to uh, feed that uh, feedback uh, right to the SBA um, so that we can uh, address any uh, problems um, either 
uh, just through the SBA changing their practices, or if it requires additional legislation, we want to know about that too. Um, lastly, I wanted to sort of switch uh, focuses um, just to recognize that I know that diversity, equity, and inclusion is a major uh, focus of DMI. And um, I'm, I'm really excited that that's a priority for you. I want, I want you to know it's a priority for me. And I thought I'd let you know about a bill that I recently introduced with uh, my colleague, uh, Senator Cory Booker of New Jersey, called the American Opportunity Accounts Act. This is a program that um, creates baby bonds. Um, what are baby bonds? Um, well, the legislation would provide every child at birth, an American Opportunity Account managed by the government and seeded with $1,000. Each year, government would provide a means-tested contribution so that lower income children would get a bigger contribution from the government up to a maximum of $50,000 by the time they turn 18. When children turn 18, the account becomes theirs to spend on higher education, buying a home, entrepreneurship, or other asset building endeavors. And a program like this, uh, according to uh, economists and scientists, could eliminate almost all of the racial wealth gap in as little as one generation. Um, it's one of the most hopeful uh, uh, pieces of legislation that I've seen in a long time um, that has uh, as its goal uh, eliminating these uh, inequities that have been so long standing in America. Lastly, I wanted to say a few words about infrastructure. Um, as mentioned, I'm a member of the Senate Committee on Commerce, Science, and Transportation. And I am very eager to get to work on a comprehensive infrastructure package, which would include new investments in our roads and bridges, but also broadband and other initiatives. Um, as, as mentioned, I'm also a member of the Appropriations Committee, which provides funding for these infrastructure programs. And my role on the Appropriations Committee helps me advocate for projects like for example, the city of Madison's proposal for bus rapid transit. Um, mobility is always going to be vital to our long-term economic development. And so I applaud uh, that particular effort to increase access to jobs and other important uh, destinations. And with that, I thought I'd wrap and uh, uh, we can have a conversation. Well, Senator, thank you so much for your, your opening words. And I, I have to first say thank you continued fight for small businesses downtown and for the workers uh, downtown, particularly simplifying the PPP process. Uh, you know, unfortunately, many businesses owned by people of color, uh, other businesses that were uh, uh, not as well banked or unbanked, didn't have the or the accounting to be able to to take part in this really important lifeline for these yeah. businesses. So that they, they can keep their family businesses, but they can also keep their employees employed. As someone that worked in hospitality, this is really important. I also want to note, thank you for hospitality as well. You know, that is a, a sector that's close to my heart, is struggling, but is the lifeblood of downtown, right? Our restaurants, our hotels. And lastly, thank you for the event venues. Uh, you know, because of the Sylvie, because of the Overture Center, because of what happens at Bree Stevens, we have this great quality of life that brings people together. And your assistance there keeps those businesses alive now that, that it, there really isn't a path forward, right? We hope the light is at the end of the tunnel, which is yes happening today in my office, but thank you for your work there. So we're going to open it up to questions to all of you. We've got a few questions of our own before we're going to ask, but if you have questions for us today, submit those questions through the Q&A function below, and I will ask those questions. We've got uh, about another half hour or more, or a little bit about a half hour with the senator here, so we're excited to have a conversation. So you mentioned the recovery acts that are happening now that are being marked up by the House uh, this week and then the Senate next week. What are some highlights that you're excited about for, for businesses and for downtowns that'll be positive coming out of hopefully these bills? Yeah, so um, the, uh, the American Rescue Package is uh, uh, hopefully 
going to be followed by a economic recovery package. So this first uh, package is really very um, pandemic specific, if you will, um, helping us go from uh, where we are right now to seeing this pandemic in the rearview mirror. Um, and so a lot of the investments really are around vac vaccination. Uh, uh, we have the promise right now of a third vaccine becoming um, available, uh, the Johnson & Johnson. Uh, unlike both Moderna and Pfizer, it is a, a one vaccination process rather than a two vaccination process. And um, uh, so the supply is going to increase. Also, eligibility for it is going to increase. Um, but I have uh, uh, been very involved in terms of shaping the American Rescue Plan uh, to make sure that we don't just uh, stop there, but make sure that we have uh, increasing numbers of people who can actually put the shots in people's arms. Um, you know, our healthcare system is at capacity. Uh, it, we're seeing some good news about fewer hospitalizations, et cetera, but it meant, means that our frontline healthcare workers are engaged in uh, taking care of people and, and not available necessarily to be out there vaccinating. And so um, we have a, a focus on, on basically deployment of the vaccine and doing it as quickly and smoothly as we can. Um, it's also going to be essential in terms of opening our schools back up. Um, teachers in Wisconsin, the states have some uh, flexibility and wh who is in the next phase of vaccination. Uh, but in Wisconsin, teachers are at the top of, of this uh, next phase. And um, that obviously is of huge um, importance to those who are, are, are juggling uh, work full-time from home and uh, children who are uh, struggling to learn remotely. Um, there's a big investment also in childcare for uh, children who are not uh, yet in uh, kindergarten through 12th grade. Uh, a lot of childcare businesses were devastated by the pandemic. And um, uh, because of the need to have greater social distancing, um, they're having to uh, lower their enrollment um, and parents are going to have some real struggles being able to afford child care as it's reopening. And so there's a very big, uh, robust investment in um, child care, recognizing it as a key part, just like transportation and other things in, in reopening the uh, economy and getting through uh, the rest of the pandemic. Um, there is finally uh, some relief in sight for states and local governments. Um, you know, that was a huge controversy. I don't understand why, uh, because to me it was obvious that there were um, so many responsibilities placed on uh, localities in the state to be at the front lines of fighting this pandemic. Um, additional expenditures that they never uh, were able to budget for because nobody predicted the pandemic was upcoming. And uh, so uh, budgets are strapped. And uh, finally, there will be some robust uh, uh, funding directed to uh, local units of government that'll include school districts, towns, counties, cities, and, uh, and the state um, of Wisconsin. And uh, I, I'm very, uh, very pleased that that's a key component of this American Rescue Plan. Um, as I said, it's being marked up in the uh, House of Representatives. Uh, they're going to probably work through the weekend to get the job done and bring it to uh, the Senate. Senate will work on its um, own plan as soon as we get the House plan and any differences between the two packages will likely be resolved in a conference committee. I'm getting into the weeds, but just so people have a sense of this. And then um, I also contained in this uh, package is an increase in the minimum wage, um, something that is, uh, uh, we haven't adjusted the minimum wage in this nation in many, many years. And, uh, uh, but the one question we have, and I'm now gonna get really in the weeds, is um, 
we're using a process called budget reconciliation to pass this. And the question uh, has been posed of the Senate parliamentarian as to whether the minimum wage is something that can be passed through this budget reconciliation process. She uh, has heard arguments on both sides and will uh, render her uh, verdict, if you will. Uh, she's sort of like a referee in this process. And, um, and that will impact the process moving forward. But we're watching it very closely with bated breath to figure out uh, what she's going to decide on that and a couple of other issues. Uh, and then uh, we're really hopeful that we will get this uh, through uh, both houses and on the president's desk prior to the magic date of March 14th. Why is March 14th uh, uh, so important? That is when uh, the unemployment extension and the um, rental assistance and mortgage assistance programs all expire, although the pandemic hasn't expired. And so we are very conscious that, uh, uh, you know, until the pandemic is behind us, uh, these extra supports uh, need to be there for people to be able to get through uh, this, this crisis, uh, both, you know, public health crisis and, uh, and economic crisis. So those are some of the highlights. Um, I, I did mention that uh, this is expected to be followed up in short order by uh, a, a recovery plan. So we have rescue followed by recovery. Um, and a big part of that is anticipated to be infrastructure, um, although that won't be exclusively uh, what it is. And um, we know that we have a huge infrastructure deficit nationwide. And uh, this, um, this is something that would, uh, would bring a lot of jobs uh, and good paying jobs. And so uh, it's something that we're going to pivot quickly to as soon as the rescue package is complete. I think speaking of, of infrastructure, I think that's a very important part of this. We've seen that as a, has worked in the past to stimulate the economy to spend on infrastructure projects. How do you think that will directly affect downtown Madison, right? You mentioned bus rapid transit earlier, uh, broadband, um, you know, there's other other items like uh, University of Wisconsin Madison, right, which is a huge economic generator and research funding that goes to them. How do you think this could directly impact us down down here in Madison? Yeah, I think it depends um, how broadly we define infrastructure. Um, we know about uh, some of the um, needs that are uh, throughout the state of Wisconsin in terms of. Uh, uh, bridges and roads that have been long neglected. Uh, but uh, many of our previous infrastructure proposals have uh, included things like uh, addressing um, conditions in, uh, in, in schools, for example, where, um, where there's been deferred maintenance and, uh, and uh, it says something to a child about the condition of their school right, how much we're willing to invest in them. So that's one example of something that might be included in an infrastructure plan um, that would uh, benefit uh, school district and therefore, you know, the, the entire uh, uh, community. Um, so I, I do anticipate there'll be a fairly broad definition of infrastructure and I, I would restate what what you did Jason that um, that includes transit and we understand uh, how important it is for people to be able to reliably get to work um, and uh, other uh, destinations of importance and uh, so that I expect will be a pretty robust part and I would mention that transit really took a hit during the pandemic uh, whether it was the upgrades that had to happen to keep bus drivers safe, uh, to keep passengers safe. Many communities waived uh, their um, uh, bus fees. And uh, so that is, I think, going to be an area of great uh, investment and, and interest. 
<clears throat> Questions from our audience here. Um, COVID has impacted people living in poverty on a much deeper level. What measures are you most engaged with to reduce poverty in our state and our nation that will have the greatest impact? Pretty important question. Absolutely. Well, uh, let me um, let me first of all uh, revisit the issue I, I talked about in terms of the what I call the baby bonds. Um, that is not contained in the rescue package, and I'm not uh, I'm not at all convinced that it will be in the in the recovery package. But I think it is a discussion that we have to have. You know, we have to have ambitious goals to uh, close. Um, unconscionable uh, income and wealth gaps in our, our country that have literally been ex exacerbated during the pandemic. Um, you know, th th probably the only sector of our society that has gained in wealth during the pandemic is the top one to five percent. And, uh, and, and we need to recognize that and understand that um, the, the commitment to uh, uh, eliminating the income and wealth gap um, is only going to create a, a rosier future. Um, the minimum wage is controversial. That is, of course, in the uh, rescue package, lifting the minimum wage nationally to $15 an hour. Um, I am of the belief uh, that, you know, while recognizing that it will be a challenge for some uh, smaller businesses in particular, um, that when somebody works uh, a full, uh, you know, a full-time job, they should not be in poverty. And uh, that is something in my mind that will um, help close, uh, help uh, reduce poverty significantly um, and also uh, improve quality of life. Uh, many people uh, working at the current minimum wage have to have several jobs in order to make ends meet. Um, that has a huge impact on families when, uh, you know, when, when, the, um, when a working parent can't spend as much time with their children because of multiple jobs, et cetera. It also has a huge impact on uh, other expenditures, uh, food stamps. Uh, other uh, programs that help low-income people. Again, if you work full-time, um, we want people to be able to get ahead without having to rely on other government programs. So um, I, I'm very hopeful that that will be included, and that's, again, something that I think will go a long way in um, reducing the poverty that we have among working people, even. A question actually follow up on that baby bonds is, you know, will it apply to those born after the act is passed or would it include, say, up to 17 year olds of passing legislation that may fall through the gap, right? The group that is sort of in that age now. How do you, how do you reconcile that? Um, I, I think right now it, it is a prospective measure. Um, and uh, it doesn't exist right now. So I think it, first of all, uh, just getting it through is going to be a very, uh, a very challenging effort, but it's such an important piece of legislation if we're going to sort of pose the question to society, how do we do this with a realistic goal of um, eliminating wealth gaps, especially racial wealth gaps within a generation. Um, so it, it won't be perfect, um, but I think prospectively, the idea is every baby born um, by the time that they're 18 will have um, a, the ability to you know, choose to open a business or buy a house or something, make an investment that is going to have a big return on, on that investment. A question we received, thank you, by the way, a question we received uh, several times here is what is the mood in Washington right now and what the ability of Congress might be to uh, get things done across party lines. What are you seeing? Uh, you've been in the Senate now for, for eight years. What are, what are you seeing? Is, is the mood there to try to get some things done in a bipartisan fashion? Um, absolutely. Uh, and, you know, I, I'll take the rescue package uh, uh, as a start. I am not at all convinced that we will get uh, many Republican votes on the final package because of the 
height, heightened partisanship. Um, we've certainly heard the Republican leaders of both houses state that they're against it. But I will tell you, it is chock full of initiatives that Republicans support. Um, so they might say in the end, the overall thing isn't exactly what they would have uh, crafted. Um, but piece by piece, these are things that um, uh, Republicans and Democrats are, are committed to. Uh, take, for example, the, um, the direct payments. This bill contains a $1,400 direct payment. Um, in the prior Congress, there was a $600 uh, direct payment that was uh, included for families or um, income earners who make $75,000 or less. Um, and it was based on the, um, on the positive results of including that direct payment in the CARES Act back uh, almost a year ago. Uh, president Trump, when he was president, said he wanted it to be $2,000. And he, that was echoed by a number of Republicans and Democrats working together. I mean, Josh Hawley and Bernie Sanders teamed up as the leaders on getting a $2,000 payment. Well, only $600 went through. President Biden said, let's finish the job. Let's include the other $1,400 to get people up to the $2,000. And so I know that provision has bipartisan support. Whether or not, again, we get the vote on final passage, it's a good example of the parties working together. I will say on a totally different um, front, um, I was honored to be invited to the Oval Office yesterday to meet with uh, President Biden and Vice President Harris um, about uh, an executive order that he was uh, signing to look at critical supply chains and um, and help us uh, promote uh, good new jobs and industries in the United States because we've learned so much through through the pandemic and other areas of what happens when we can't uh, uh, when we can't produce things on our own. You know, the look at the chaos about getting N95 masks. You know, look at the chaos on trying to get testing swabs and reagents um, uh, a year ago. So to look at these critical supply chains to try to bring some of these jobs back to the US, this meeting that I'm referring to was wholly bipartisan. I think there were more Republicans in the room than there were Democrats. Um, but it was, um, 201 we agreed on the critical nature of this challenge and uh, we're offering uh, suggestions and ideas and brainstorming with the President of the United States on, on what we could do together to address these issues. Well, it's, it's good to hear that the conversations continue because I think so much of the work is done in the middle, right, in figuring out through compromise how we can best move forward with the company, with the country. So mm -hmm. specifically, we had several questions about, you know, what is the lifeblood of a downtown, right? It's all the office workers, the residents, the events, and, and, and tourism. And the tourism sector is suffering right now. Our mm -hmm. is uh, for the federal government to help provide additional resources. I know, you know, one of the highlights was that now 501c6s and some of these uh, destination organizations are now eligible for PPP, which is mm -hmm. huge. Assist, so thank you very much. Are there other ways that we can help the tourism sector? Because right, it's a 1.4 billion dollar a year industry in Dane County, and three over 300 million just in downtown Madison alone. Yes. Well. Um so I would say a couple of things. One, in terms of being uh, a, a senator from an entire state, um, I would reflect in terms of the, uh, the communications I've had during the pandemic, meeting with industry groups, et cetera, that the impact uh, on tourism has not been even throughout the state. So in the Northwoods, for example, there are some counties that saw record uh, uh, yeah, I mean, it's hard, hard to you pinch yourself when you say it, like record uh, 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 attract, or, you know, people attracted there, uh, going to uh, restaurants and hotels and doing outdoor recreation in particular. Um, you know, people who were trying to flee uh, uh, the pandemic, at least in their minds. And, and, and then we had uh, especially in um, uh, urban areas of the state, um, just the opposite. 
just the opposite. So we have to be flexible to uh, respond to uh, regional variations, et cetera. But I do think, um, you know, things like the Restaurant Act and Save Our Live Venues um, all have a specific focus on the hospitality industry. And um, in the PPP program, you know, making sure that um, restaurants and other associated hospitality industries are eligible for higher level loans, um, which is was included in the most recent uh, uh, program. Uh, but we know we also have to do more. We're looking at um, uh, getting more of what was called the Restaurants Act, part of which was included in the year-end package, but more needs to be done. So I think um, industry-specific uh, legislation is important during the pandemic. Um, and just recognizing, again, what I said earlier, is that these were the first to close and um, in many cases will be the last to reopen. Uh, so getting to reopening as fast as we can through vaccination and uh, other measures is key. We all play a part in that. Um, and, uh, and then making sure that these programs that at first were one size fits all and one size didn't fit all, that we're now tailoring them for uh, the specific industries. Next question is a big one for Madison. As you know, uh, we have the second uh, highest, highly educated 25 to 34 year old group in the country, only after Boston, uh, with a million different colleges. So there's a lot of people that have gone to university here and student debt, I think is, is a major factor. What, where are we with student loan uh, forgiveness? Yeah, there's a, a, an active debate uh, going on right now. Um, and mostly I think, uh, there's a lot of willingness to do it, um, but there's a disagreement over uh, what the dollar figure should be and whether it should be means tested. Um, so I, I, that debate has to play out. Um, there, are, uh, there are folks advocating for the federal government to use um, its fullest authority to forgive as much as possible. Um, and then there's those who say um, uh, that this really does have to be a means-tested program. Um, I don't have a crystal ball to tell you exactly how I suspect that will work out. Um, but I, I certainly think that, um, you know, in a community like Madison, again, where you do have um, many people who've benefited from higher education and many people who have really crippling debt, um, you know, weigh in uh, on this conversation. I, I, I will say also that there have been, of course, um, uh, some deferment of uh, student debt payments contained in the CARES Act, et cetera, because for those who have lost their employment, you know, struggling to keep up with rent or mortgage, student loan debt repayment, uh, and so many other bills that accumulate uh, at a time when income is, is greatly reduced. Um, those have been an important lifeline, but it doesn't eliminate the debt, it defers it. And so, uh, yeah, the next step is for us to figure out um, uh, what sort of relief uh, should be uh, pushed forward. I think the, the last question and the most important question I'll ask today is, you know, how, how is everything with you? you know, it's, it has to be a very difficult time uh, in Washington going through so much. How are you holding up? And what can we do to help you um, in your job? Oh, how lovely. Well, um, yes, it has been a really hard time. Um, I will say, you know, um, the, the, the partisan tensions, the... Um, the conspiracies surrounding uh, conspiracy theories surrounding the last election, which have not been uh, fully put to rest yet. Um, the violent insurrection was so frightening. Uh, uh, I think it's in some ways, um, you know, became uh, more frightening after the fact as we went through the trial and realized how close we really were to. Uh, uh, you know, something that is already disastrous, but could have become more disastrous. Um, I'm, I'm doing the down first before I get to the up. 
but the other thing is like you know i'm i'm on my apartment or in my apartment uh my my makeshift studio in the corner uh uh, and I'm a block from uh, from the Capitol complex, and there is uh, eight foot high fencing and um, razor wire uh, uh, in sort of a fortress. Um, and there are still uh, thousands of National Guard patrolling the inside of that perimeter. And um, that's a visual sort of reminder of the very serious threats we had to our democracy as a whole. That said, uh, uh, impeachment trial behind us, new majority for Democrats, as thin as it can get, 50-50 with the vice president breaking the ties. But I feel like we've turned a corner and are now working vigorously to confirm Joe Biden's uh, cabinet nominees. Uh, we'll get uh, another one confirmed today for the Department of Energy and Cardona is in line to be confirmed next week for the Department of Education. Um, and we're working on these very powerful pieces of legislation that will provide, uh, you know, first the rescue plan and then we're queuing up to be able to work on uh, the recovery plan. And those, those are the things we ran on um, you know, providing for the American people and the hope that we can pass things that people can see tangible um, results, that their life is getting better, their communities are getting stronger, that um, uh, we're getting past this pandemic, that the hope and, and, and opportunity of that feels so positive to me and to have a role in that based on all of your feedback is critical. Wow, it's spam. It was a spam call. Their spam is, that's, I think that's a, honestly a, a great way to add a spam call right at the end. Senator, thank you for all you're doing. We, uh, here in Madison, we do see the light at the end of the tunnel. Obviously, a lot of people are suffering uh, here in Denver and here in our community. But knowing that there are leaders like you, uh, they're helping to commit. We absolutely greatly appreciate your support. If you ever need any, any of our members at DMI, please don't hesitate to ask. So thank you so much for the time today. We know you have to run off thank to you. a committee meeting, but we are so, so appreciative for you being here as well. Oh, thank, thank you. Thank you very much, Senator. Thank all right. All. Um, thank you as well for joining us today. We really do appreciate it. We hope you all have a great rest of the day. I want to thank our sponsors, Whipley LLP, Ho-Chunk Gaming Madison, Michael Best, and Friedrich, the State Bank of Cross Plains, Carlson Black, our sponsor this week. Thank you, Dan and Angie and Matt, the beautiful Edgewater Hotel, and UW Health, Unity Point Health, Meritor, and Quartz. We wouldn't be here without you guys. Thank you so much for your continued support. We appreciate all of you guys are doing, and we hope to see you at another event with DMI coming soon. Have a wonderful rest of the day. Stay warm. It's happening. And most importantly, stay healthy. We'll talk to you soon. I know.